Hi everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about using Exasol to scale Tableau at Piedmont Healthcare. My name is Mark Jackson. I am the Director of Business Intelligence for Piedmont Healthcare. Uh, I have a slide coming up where we'll kind of go into a little bit more about myself. But first, um, let's talk about Piedmont Healthcare, um, where I work. We are a seven hospital system around the metro Atlanta area, um, soon to be 10 hospitals. Piedmont has a pretty aggressive growth strategy. Um, which has kind of led us down this path to where we're looking at uh, replacing Tableau extracts with um, Exasol and really needing to figure out ways to scale our Tableau program. Um, you see a lot of stats uh, here on the page, but um, the one I'd probably draw your attention to is that last year Piedmont served nearly 2 million patients. So um, quite a few uh, patient lives that uh, we are impacting with our use of data. So with this slide, this is uh, something I built in Tableau just to kind of give my background. I've, I've been asked on many occasions to kind of um, you know, explain what my history was, especially once I became a Tableau Zen Master. So shortly um, thereafter, I put together this visualization that talks about um, where I was living, what tools I was working with, what my skill level was, and then you can kind of see towards the bottom what my work and education experience uh, was like, where I was working, uh, where I went to school. If there's one thing that you can learn though from this slide is that it's really important to make all of your major career changes during major life events. So um, you can see that I married my wife uh, right about the time I started my career at KPMG. I transitioned to the Piedmont Heart Institute uh, around the time my daughter was born and then moved into the corporate office within Piedmont Healthcare where I am, um, became the manager of business intelligence at the time, at the time my uh, son was born. So really good advice. Actually, probably not the best advice in the world to, to make those major transitions at the same time. Um, but anyway, moving on, let's, uh, let's talk about what we, uh, how we started our program. We set out from the beginning um, kind of with a blank slate with our BI program. And um, I knew I needed a set of guiding principles to start with so that we wouldn't run this thing off the rails right off the beginning. So the ideas that we came up with is that we wanted to make sure data was being democratized. We create this army of creative data sense makers. This was something that I stole from Christian Chabot from one of my earlier Tableau conferences uh, where he spoke of creating a, you know, this army of data sense makers. And that really um, struck a chord with me. So I make it a core part of one of our guiding principles. Um, we really wanted to, to um, leverage all of the, um, the intelligence and capabilities of the people at Piedmont and, and didn't want to be a bottleneck with one central corporate service servicing everybody, but take advantage of everybody's um, power to build things on their own. Um, secondly, we wanted to make sure that data was immediately available to decision makers. So it was really important there that um, if you were to walk into a meeting and somebody was to question the information that you had, that you had the ability to immediately pivot, to run a filter. Um, yeah, I can remember when we, before Tableau, we would have, I would build my analysis out of Excel and I would take, uh, build charts out of that and put them into PowerPoint presentations. And inevitably somebody would question something and I would not have the ability to do anything about it immediately. So. Um, by the time you could get everybody back in the room after you've redone your analysis and rebuilt your PowerPoint presentation, it's possible that weeks have gone by. And so uh, having the power to, to make those pivots in the meeting to uh, adjust um, your calculations, your filters, all that, and your visualization on the fly makes a huge difference and speed to insight. Secondly, our sorry, third thing on the list here, uh, reports are no more than 24 hours old. So we haven't necessarily hit that ideal in every case, but now that we're moving into Exasol, that's becoming much more of a reality for us with our ability to, to get data refreshed very quickly, even on really massive data sets. Uh, the next one there is visualization should seamlessly enable users to explore data from that summary level to detail. So this is important if a user was to see a KPI metric and something was read and we wanted to know, well, why? Uh, because that's the first question. We want to know why aren't we hitting the targets that we set. So it's important from that point to be able to drill down to the next level of detail. So what's the 
five minute analysis of what's going on and then from there what's you know that 30 minute to hour analysis to figure out you know what steps do we need to take to to fix the problem and then lastly we want to make sure that um, there was a consolidated single portal where um, people could consume data and this isn't just from a you know a place to drop reports that are categorized and and users can come to that to get the reports they need but also just a single presentation layer that we can sit on top of any data set. So Tableau was that for us. You didn't have to be an expert in uh, 15 different systems and their reporting solutions. You could just attach Tableau to it. Um, you were already familiar with it and it was just a matter of learning a new data set. So I'm going to go through um, some of the content that, that I've presented before at, at prior Tableau conferences. So some of you may have seen some of these things, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to show you think, the kinds of things that we're doing with Tableau. And then I'm going to move into um, a demonstration of some of the things that we're now using um, with Exasalt. Um, don't worry if I rush through that, those demonstrations. You can always come out to my blog um, where I've written about these things in detail, so feel free to visit that. Um, you'll see my blog address at the end of the presentation, but it's just it's here at the top. It's ugamarkj.blogspot.com. Okay, so moving into some of the content here, this first visualization, this is looking at um, our hospital statistics dashboard. This is one of the early things that I created in Tableau. And so these, these three charts, they repeat themselves for each statistic. So it might be inpatients and outpatients and emergency room visits. But quickly, you could kind of um, analyze which months are we hitting targets, um, which ones are we not with the bar charts there. Um, to the right of that, you can see cumulative variances over time. So you can see if you're trending in the right direction or the wrong direction. And lastly, you can kind of tell how you're doing versus prior year with a forecasted number um, at the end. So we were able to compress quite a bit of information to a single visualization, one that you could stand at the back of the room and kind of tell which areas um, are your problem areas and then drill in further uh, for detail. Another example is looking at things like readmission data. So um, this is an example of a quality dashboard that we have. And so this might be showing something like heart failure. Um, you can see how many patients were discharged with heart failure versus how many were, were readmitted. Uh, we've since created a newer version of this, but I like showing this one because I really enjoy the rainbow chart at the bottom. Um, which is telling you how many patients are readmitted after 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, with your black line being um, total readmissions, your gray line being um, readmitted with something um, different, and then the red line being people readmitted with the same thing. So you were discharged with heart failure, you came back in with heart failure. The gray line could be anything. You could get discharged um, with heart failure and readmitted with hit by a bus. And unfortunately, that actually counts against you as well for um, you can be readmitted for any reason. And then you are penalized for that um, from a CMS standpoint. This next one is another example of a quality dashboard. This is something we work with um, Health Catalyst. Um, and then Curtis Harris, who was an IronViz champ last year, um, I believe helped with the design of this. And sepsis is a serious blood infection and which can lead to death if it's not treated appropriately. When you come in and there's an alert that fires on you, when you, um, a nurse or a physician identifies you as being potentially septic, there are certain things that should happen within four hours. Um, you should get lactate, blood cultures, antibiotics, and um, fluids should be administered. So this um, dashboard is meant to, to check us operationally to see whether or not we are doing all of those things for a patient within a four hour period of time. And there was a dramatic reversal in these numbers just when we started to put the data out there um, and ensuring that we're doing all of those really important things for our patients. And it has a big um, impact on outcome. And in a later slide, you'll see um, some of the outcomes um, that have improved over prior year as a result of us using data. Um, this is operational stuff looking at first case on time starts. So if you don't get your first case of the day started on time, the rest of your day is kind of screwed, right? Um, because everybody behind that is now going to be delayed and your patient experience isn't going to be good. So this dashboard lets you monitor um, how often are we getting our first case of the day started on time. And then at the bottom you can kind of see a Gantt chart and that shows you your plan time versus your actual time, which ones are we going over on. Um, 
But the, the cool thing about this one um, that I really like is the fact that it helps you figure out when you've got problems in the data. We want to know why we're late. So you have to document a reason in the healthcare record system as to what was the cause of it. Did the doctor show up late? Was there some staff meeting um, that caused it to um, delay? And so there's a column uh, to the right, that second one from the bottom, last column is uh, percent of late cases that don't have a justification. So that's monitored and there's a drill down dashboard that lets you see that. This is um, using some geospatial data to see how we're doing and what we would consider our market um, around the Atlanta area. And this has changed, um, having included some of the new markets since we've expanded. But you can clearly see how you're doing from an inpatient um, perspective versus all your competitors. Where are competitors gaining? Where are we losing? You could drill this in by service line. So um, are we doing better in neurology? Or are we uh, not doing so well? Uh, maybe in spine or transplant compared to everybody else? And who's winning and losing? Press Ganey survey data, so um, Steve Wexler actually um, gave me a lot of feedback. He was my inspiration for this design for doing survey data. So everything that's a negative answer shifts to the left. Everything that's a positive answer shifts to the right. This is using Likert scale data, and apparently Likert is the right way to pronounce that. I'm told I called it Likert forever. Probably like a big dummy to anybody who actually knew the guy. This is the most looked at dashboard in our entire system. Though. This is labor data. Um, labor data by far is the most um, expensive thing for a healthcare system by a long shot. Um, and so we really focus on this um, dashboard to make sure we're not spending too much overtime um, with our nursing staff, um, that we're not using too much contract labor because contract labor is more expensive. So there's a series of metrics that are being monitored and we put people's names next to this if you're the head of that department. So you really don't want to show up on this list because this is our most looked at dashboard, right? And our leaders are looking at this, and so they're going to want to know what is it that, that's going wrong. But we actually have a team that coaches. We have a labor productivity team. So if they, they're monitoring this dashboard more than anything else, if they see a problem, they're going and coaching uh, the nursing managers and saying, what's going on? What, what can we help you fix? What's, um, what's your style of working with your staff? Um, so it's a very proactive dashboard that, that makes a big difference. And then we have a lot of fun with Tableau 2. So this is a, uh, something I submitted for one of the Iron Viz competitions, but we do this actually every year at Piedmont. This is March Madness data um, that we get all our employees that want to participate. We give them a spreadsheet and say, fill the, fill the bracket out, and we consolidate all that data and bring it together in a dashboard. And you have a circular bracket uh, up there in the top left. Everything you got wrong turns black as you move towards the center. Um, if you got it right, the color persists. This is my dashboard, so you can kind of see that um, I'm not that good at this. The, the bump chart there is your rank over time. So I immediately sucked this year and had a little bit of like hope in the middle of round one, and then it was just suckage from there on out. All right, so cool things, right? We've done a lot of cool things. It's all pre-Exosol. We've, we've built all this stuff. So why do we need Exosol? And I hear this from you know, our own Piedmont executive team. I had to make the case. So here's why. We started out with a connection to EPSI, which was our decision support system, pulling that data into Tableau. That worked pretty well. We were able to do a lot with that. Then we added Epic um, as we installed that as our electronic healthcare record system. Started adding SQL Server um, EDW attempt number one, followed by SQL Server EDW attempt number two. And this was all to try to make our extracts faster because they were taking way too long to build. And so we tried to transform the data um, before we bring it into Tableau to make all that faster. And that was somewhat successful, but still ultimately um, not scalable. Uh, the Piedmont Clinic had their own SQL server, and then um, the Piedmont Physicians Group actually uh, not having a SQL server of their own had their own uh, that they were transforming data in and plugging that into Tableau. So a lot happening there. Add PeopleSoft data, press Ganey data to it, and then we started adding more hospitals, and you can see we've kind of got a mess on our hands. This dashboard in particular is really important. And like any really important dashboard, it takes a while to load. So let's, yeah, let's give this a second. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it depends on the dashboard. I mean, there's a lot of them. I'll go through it in detail on one in particular. All right, finally, there we go, right? Dashboard loaded. That's actually just an illustration of the problem, right? I mean, we get that frustration from, especially executives, they're like, 
I don't have 20 seconds to wait on this dashboard. You know, they give up after two seconds and the thing isn't loaded yet, which is frustrating because I want to like, you didn't get reports previously until, you know, 15 days after the close of the month and they were printed and shipped to you on a truck and now you can't wait 20 seconds. I mean, everything's amazing and nobody's happy, right? <laughs> so you constantly, you know, you're setting the bar for yourself and then you have to beat that and so... This is constant battle. And this, this dashboard, though, is monitoring. This is something I've got on my blog that you could actually download to monitor your own Tableau extracts. Um, but you see the one that's red there. That's called the uh, MOAQ charge. This was before I um, realized that you actually can't rename sources in Tableau, which is frustrating. Jason, if you could help me take care of that. OK, sweet. Excellent. So um, MOAQ stands for the mother of all queries. You guys might have seen the Moab bomb in the news not so long ago. That was my inspiration for the mother of all queries. If you saw the sequel behind it, you would understand. But six hours load time, and I've got a cut off there. I'm like, uh, if it's not loading in six hours, let's just cancel this thing. So, but that's typically about the amount of time that this thing takes to refresh. So if something fails, like it did today, I've now got another six hours probably before I can get refresh data to somebody in the Tableau extract. So maybe Hyper cuts that in half. I guess we'll see. Um, what it does, but that leads to this, right? <laughs> I'm not a social drinker. Most of my drinking is now work related, and so then now that we have a problem, if if my work is leading me to this frustrating place, like ah, I can't get my data, you know, into the tool so people can analyze it, and everybody's driving me crazy, you know, asking me to refresh things that are failing, yeah. So that leads us to to XSL. Currently, we have a three-node cluster of active nodes and then a reserve node. The reserve node kind of kicks in if one of the active nodes um, goes down. 300 gigs of RAM that we've thrown at it um, because we sized that on roughly three terabytes of data. Um, we have already purchased the license for 600 gigs. I've got my servers in place. I'm hoping at the end of this month that we'll have all of these servers running. So um, if you don't know about XSL, XSL is a, a massively parallel processing database in memory, column store. So what happens is when a, any, any user issues a query, um, each server has a segment of the data that it goes and um, finds the answer for, and they all come back together with the answer, a lot like Google does when you, you know, issue a search. It's not one single server, you know, like SQL Server would be, that's trying to answer the thing for every, for every table. So um, you can divvy up the data, and it can be a lot more efficient by parallel processing and all that, and it's orders of magnitude uh, faster. All right, so that one data source that I mentioned that took six hours, we have now uh, replaced that. We have a, a new hospital charge, uh, or actually hospital transactions data source because it has more than just charge data. It has payments and adjustments in it now. There's no limit on our date range. Uh, this one, I think, was limited to maybe 24 months, roughly, of data that we could keep in it and successfully refresh in around six hours. In XSL, it takes me four minutes to get that data set updated. So, you know, Hyper, you saw the presentation, right? And hey, maybe it's twice as fast, but it's still an extract. And you can't uh, implement an incremental strategy on an extract very well, especially when you have your um, historical data that's potentially getting updated too. So you need a more advanced um, process to set up an incremental strategy. So that's a big deal. So if something doesn't happen right, I didn't get the file pulled from the source system, and four minutes later, I can repull it and get it all processed, and now it's up to date. And because it's a live connection and we're not waiting all this time, it's just immediately available uh, in Tableau. This is a dashboard I'm, I'm particularly proud of that helps monitor for infection data in, in the system. So we have a group of infection preventionists that are monitoring this dashboard every day. Um, this is uh, looking at uh, microbiology uh, information that's coming from our healthcare record system. So they're trying to identify things that are multi-drug resistant organisms and trying to figure out, was any of that inquired in the hospital? Um, so we can do research, figure out what, what happened, and um, report that out publicly. And so they, they use this dashboard, and, and our, we, we had this built before Exosol, and using Tableau Extracts. It's my 10 minute warning on the talking part here with presentation. So the, uh, we were able to get this delivered to them and updated by 1.30 in the afternoon, which kind of sucked for them because they wanted to be working on yesterday's data in the morning and they would have to wait till the afternoon to actually figure out what happened yesterday. The load time started creeping up as we um, added more um, hospitals uh, to the system. So it was taking about a minute for this dashboard to load and they weren't very happy about that. And I kind of agree, that sucks. Um, and we only kept rolling six months of data in it. 
After we migrated this to Exasol, we were able to deliver the dashboard to them with the updates from yesterday by 8.30 in the morning. The load time went from one minute to 10 seconds, and we doubled the amount of data that was actually, so we put 12 months of data of history in this data source. So that was a big deal. Um, made a big difference to the consumers of this data, our infection preventionists, because they weren't wasting half of their day with stuff that they had worked on yesterday. This is something we've been able to scale with um, as well. And I was trying to do this, this kind of stuff previously. I've got a subsequent slide that talks about the timing of all this, but we, especially as we migrate all this stuff to Exasol, we wanna make sure that people know where all this stuff comes from because we're offering way more fields than we ever have in the past um, to people. So we'll encode the definition from the dictionary in the tool tips that mouse, when you mouse over the fields in Tableau. Um, and that's a painful process when you do that manually because you right click on the field and then go to edit the comment and then you type all this stuff in, rich text formatting, and then invariably you don't get it all right. Now, we've got a Python process that's using the data dictionary that we have loaded into Exasol, um, Python code to leverage with the Tableau REST API. And what all of this is doing, and I'll demo this in, in just a minute, is it downloads the data sources it edits the XML files, because the TDS files are just XML files that describe the data connection. It writes all those comments in it from the um, XSL data dictionary, and it's able to do quite a bit of that uh, very fast. So my manual process is described here. When I used to do this before we, uh, we automated it, two sources, roughly 700 fields, took me five weeks and a lot of whiskey. So you can imagine data quality, and probably not that high <laughs> as I'm typing drinking my maker's mark. Um, but in the bottom, if I, I guess I can't, can I zoom in here? Let's see. What? Yay. You know, finished 13 TDS files containing 10,091 fields, and you'll see this um, execute in a minute. Uh, this was done over Wi-Fi, so the, the number of seconds is a little slower, but I've seen it do uh, 26 data sources and you know 20,000 fields roughly in about five minutes. All right. Uh, data dictionary we've made available to uh, in the form of a Tableau dashboard to make it easy to kind of track down where information comes from. It's all searchable. And this one's important too because this is a dependency tracker that, so as we've shifted to live connections, a lot of things are connected to views. And so if we're updating a table that view depends on, we want to know whether or not that's going to impact a bunch of things downstream. So this is using a view that we've written in um, Exasol, leveraging some regular expressions to figure out what tables are all part of a view. Um, and then Tableau attaches to that, and so I can easily see, you know, if we modify this, what's it going to affect? And then we balance everything every day, so we, we monitor this uh, each day to figure out, uh, are we imbalanced because we're doing incremental strategies? Something could easily break, so we balance that back to our source system so we can easily see if there's variances. And even more cool is we can do this field by field. So I've got a um, couple Python scripts, one that's profiling my data set in SQL Server, which is our source system of this data, and one that's profiling Exasol, and it's looking for differences field by field and number of um, count distincts on each of those, the sum of those, the min, the max, percent nulls. This is my field profiling um, algorithm. Just to compare Exasol to SQL Server on very simple queries where there's really not any where clauses, it's just, um, you know, count distinct, sums, averages for individual fields. XSL is 25% faster. So um, XSL can profile 45 and a half fields um, per minute. SQL Server can churn through about 1.8 fields per minute. And so that works itself out because I only give it a kind of a max operating window. Uh, it takes me 12 days currently, uh, running at a maximum of four hours a day to profile all of these fields in SQL Server. Um, XSL does all that in two hours. It's a big deal. And query monitoring, um, this has Todd's name in it, but I don't think he would be um, offended by this because this really wasn't his fault. But I can easily monitor all the queries that people are running. This actually comes through Tableau's logs um, to see what queries people are running because I need to be able to tie the users to the queries and my system accounts connecting to Exasol. Um, but this pulls from server log files. And I can see who's running something ridiculous. Um, so you can still do stupid things, write stupid queries against XSL. This one pulled back 3.7 million records because he dropped something on a filter and didn't realize he probably should pause it first. Hey, Jason, can you fix that too? Yeah. So Tableau doesn't do something stupid like that. Yeah. Excellent. See how this works? Record level security is also super easy to implement. 
Um, I'm going to demo column level security, which kind of follows the same concept. Um, but I don't have to use user filters now. I can all manage all this stuff in view. So this is just a screenshot of record level, and this one's a screenshot of um, column level security, but I'll talk through that in a little bit more detail. I'm also going to demo this. This is a tool we call Edit, XSL Data Input Tool. So this allows us to get data directly into XSL from things like spreadsheets or just give them a web form. Um, and so the cool thing about this is that if somebody has a uh, you know, data mart that we've built, because we'll still materialize some tables from really complex things. I don't want every query Tableau runs to run against a billion records. Um, so we'll materialize some of the views, but some of that has embedded codes in it. And it's a pain in the butt when they add a new code to the healthcare record system and the business user tells you that and you gotta go back and modif uh, modify SQL code. Here we can just give them a web form and say, you know, go enter that data uh, in here, add a new code. We'll implement that, um, uh, that snippet of code into our SQL statement. And so they have full control um, over the data model at that point. And there's some other screenshots. And then we've done some cool things sent post XSL, things like uh, unique patients dashboard. I don't think this one had the clinic members, which is why the number's closer to 1.3 than 2 million that I mentioned earlier. Um, excess patient days, so we can see you know, who is staying longer than they should be staying in the system based on benchmark data. This one's super important from a quality standpoint. It's are we, um, what's our compliance rates with cleaning beds and getting patients bathed and make sure um, hands are washed and the hand washing thing actually comes from the patient's perception using survey data. Um, so that's a, some of these things are difficult to manage because the, uh, the place where they wash their hands might actually be outside of the room and so the patient might perceive it wrong. So, uh, but we can see that by unit and then we can identify those problems and maybe address that by making that sure that happens in the room. Um, SSI colon prevention, this is an infection that we're looking at. So we can see you know, our, our positive improvement rates after we've started to monitor this dashboard daily. Looking at overall infection rates uh, in the dashboard for lots of different types of infections that we're monitoring. But this is the outcome of this, and this is, you know, gets back to why I love doing this in healthcare. So Piedmont has as a goal um, to have zero harm in our system. And that is a very high and lofty goal uh, to have. There are eight metrics showing on this dashboard, and this isn't Tableau, this is just some we track in Excel, um, but comes from Tableau data sources where the columns at the top are each individual hospitals, the rows are making um, uh, individual metrics that we're monitoring, and you can see all the zeros over there. So there's eight things where there were zero harm for an entire year, which is a pretty amazing feat. Um, the second line there, those are uh, um, LeapFrog scores, that's publicly reported data on the healthcare system. You can see across the board, we have A pluses on every single one of our hospitals, which is also an amazing achievement because we weren't there several years ago when we first started leveraging data. Um, to impact these processes. And then this is just some stats that were reported uh, recently at our director's retreat about percent reduction in harm over the prior year. So um, different infections like CLABZ and C. diff and CAUTI and MRSA. So over the prior year, in total, 37% reduction in um, harm that has occurred to the patients, which is also very amazing. So this is just the power of leveraging data uh, in our system to make sure that um, we have this positive impact on every patient life that we touch. So in summary, uh, as you've seen, the Excel has dramatically increased the amount of data that's available to our end users. We've, um, that says 1.6 billion, but I'm gonna try to demo one with 1.8 billion records in a minute. And modeled sources want to join all this stuff together, well over a trillion records. 25% uh, faster than SQL Server and complex things, it's actually up to 50% in my own testing faster than SQL Server. Um, data sword lo um, loads are happening really fast. Security is easy to apply. Uh, we actually are considering allowing our advanced users direct access to this database because that was something we was big no-no with SQL Server, but XSL is so fast that we can actually consider doing that. Uh, fields are standardized. The data can be easily manipulated with our web form tool. And then finally, this is the most important one for me. Alcohol use is now limited to socialization instead of being my coping mechanism for all the crappy monotonous work. All right, so demo, let's see. Yay, I'm still connected. I have as a backup some videos, so in case something fails, I think one of them I st still might show the video because I don't want to run it in production. All right, so the first thing was to, uh, you know, we want to look at 
XML data, and it's not something I talked about, but it's cool because you can't do this in Tableau today. You can use JSON data, but you can't use um, XML data. So let's use XML data in Tableau. This is a script that I wrote in Python that lets you parse through an XML file that's sitting on a web server. So I will flip over here to Chrome and go to this tab. So this is my XML file that I've got here. Uh, it's got a format where it's got a header record. In the header record, there's a question map. This question map tells me these IDs relate to this particular question. I'm gonna need that when I get the responses because the responses reference the ID. Um, each of the survey responses, and this is all just sample data that um, we get from Press Ganey. This is an actual PMOT data. Um, but you can see in the patient level data um, tab, there's a survey ID, a client ID, the service they came in for, uh, and a discharge date. And then some of these, um, let's see, let me scroll down here a little bit. There's an analysis, a demographics, age caps, and comments section. So demographics are exactly what they say. You know, they're information about the demographics of the patients. I want those to make columns for me. And the analysis, age caps, and comments are individual responses to questions. So question R1 had a value of four using the Likert scale. Uh, P2 had a value of four. Um, age caps has some different kind of responses. So those are kind of text-based responses. And then comments are obviously, you know, text here. Nursing staff seemed a little bit thin, negative sentiment. So um, we want to try to use this in Tableau. So my Python script, let me zoom back out, flip back over. Um, this just combs through different tags. Um, you'll you remember some of these tags from the um, looking at the XML file, patient level data, had the actual responses. We loop through all that stuff down here. Uh, going a little fast. There we go. So you can see it iterates through each one of the analysis questions and it's gonna print that out. So I'm just gonna execute this real quick and it's gonna to connect to that file. You'll see everything kind of comes back in this CSV sort of format. So I did all that in Python. So we can actually implement this Python script into Exasol. So I'll just flip over to the Exa Plus client. This is the same exact script. There are some minor differences. You add this um, run function in here in variables is something that actually references the variables that are in the script here. So I've got my inputs, which is my URL, and then my output, which is all the fields that I'm returning from my XML file. And then the other change compared to what I had in um, the Python script is instead of print, I put variables that emit. So emit matches the column headers that you saw in the function create statement. So let's give this a try and see if we can get all of this stuff in Exasol. So here I've got my function I was just showing you, UDF parse press gainy. I've got my web address where you were just viewing that in Chrome. And I'm gonna execute this. And you can see very quickly, I got all that stuff back um, into Exasol into a table format. Let's take it one step further and just show that we can actually use this in Tableau. So I'm gonna go here. Let's go to Tableau. Um, I will use this one. Connect to data. Go to Exasol and log in here. I just need to select a schema so that I actually paste some custom SQL code in here. All right, here's our custom SQL object, and I'm going to paste that query we just ran. Hit OK. Come over here, and now you can see I've got all my fields in Tableau that are available for me to begin to use. So, question. And there's all our individual questions. We're querying this XML file live off of a web server on the fly. So we could easily start to ask questions about what was our survey values and all that. I'm not gonna spend too much more time because I have many more things to demo. All right, let's see. Next up was column security. All right, let's flip over. This is in the same file here. Go away. There we go. All right, so one of the things you wanna make sure that you don't do is give everybody in the company access to sensitive fields. So you don't want to give, let them see things like mother's maiden name or address 
or um, address information or their phone numbers. There's a small subset of people in the organization that should have, actually have access to that data. So this is connected to my patient table. I've got a view on the back end, um, as you saw from the PowerPoint presentation, that controls the security. What's happening here is there is an initial SQL statement that's being passed. This was added to Tableau in version three. So if I edit this data source, and then I look at this little drop down, there's a place where you can put in initial SQL code. So this just inserts into a table in my data warehouse uh, in the Tableau monitoring schema. Uh, current session, which is a um, XSL function, the Tableau server user, so that's the ID of the person logged into Tableau. So now I can easily relate that database session to the user who's actually logged in. And now I can use that for everything, for every query that's being passed to it. Let me see who's connected. Let me check a security table to see what they're authorized to see, and then return the resor results appropriately. All right, cancel this, and let me go back. So as you can see, I'm unauthorized to view these fields. Tech, uh, address line one, address line two, mother's maiden name, nothing's coming back. We've got 3.7 million records here that we're querying. Let me flip back over to Exa Plus and let's change my rights. Actually, let me talk about, the, here's the view, first of all. So I'm connected to the patient table and then I've just got some case statements in here. It says, if the count from my column security view, which is looking at the user logged in, and the table is the patient table and the column is address line one. If the value comes back and it's greater than zero, then that user is authorized to see that field. And then the actual field value populates. Otherwise, it says unauthorized, like you see in my Tableau view. The uh, column security one looks like this. Um, user column security elements is a table, and I'll show you that in just a second, that defines what each user is allowed to see. And we try to do this based on job codes because if somebody transfers to a new job, um, they shouldn't have access to that data point anymore. Uh, if, if they are given access based on a given user ID, then um, we set an expiration date. So you only have access for a period of time before that expires and you kind of have to re-up your authorization. All right, so that table, the column security elements one looks like this. And so this is for me. So we can see the patient table we're connected to, we can see the individual fields. The one I'm gonna impact here is this address line two field. That's the uh, record ID 17. So that's the one we're gonna modify. So I'm gonna change that. Today, what, the 11th? Yeah. Just give me authorization through the 11th. So the to date is you know, a range that's authorized from date to date to today's date. We've updated that record. And now let's flip back over to Tableau. I'm gonna refresh this table. So it forces a requery. When you refresh the table, it has to update all the metadata too. And there we go. Now I see all the address line two information just by making a change uh, in the database. And so the cool thing here is that for anywhere I've implemented this patient table, which is gonna be in basically every source I publish, um, that's just impacted that user. So they can see this information in every source. I haven't had to download things, change things, republish data sources, that all happens immediately. All right. Group security management. So. That one, I have this, so this is my new process for managing where we publish content on Tableau Server. I have this project um, folder called employee data. And this is where anything that has, that's coming from like HR systems, um, labor, um, labor data systems, is gonna get published into this. And it says who the data custodians are. They own this, they're the people that are gonna have to approve changes um, uh, and update the list of job codes that uh, are approved for access to this. And I can actually click this link employee workbook access. This is gonna open up a, let's proceed. This is gonna query XSL and report back to me. All the users are actually part of that employee work workbook access. So I'm trying to troubleshoot this or figure out if a certain person has access to the data when I publish it there. Uh, there you'll see that uh, in this query. But that's a group name in Tableau. So employee workbook access is a group that's on Tableau server. 
Uh, in a future development, we have this request access link. This is going to go to a web forum so that the data custodian that owns this, the two people you see here, will get an email and saying, hey, so-and-so is needing access to this. Um, do you want to grant it? They can um, click a link in their email and it updates the table uh, in the background. There's a Python script behind this that manages it. And that is this guy here. And so I'm going to execute this. This is going to connect. Um, whoop, scrolls really fast. This is going to connect. I'm going to go ahead and run it now and describe it as it goes through it. It connects to um, XSL, figures out um, what are all the groups that we're trying to manage, because I've got a set of tables on there uh, that are managing the groups. I don't think I can pull those up for you in a second. Um, it's going to connect to our Tableau server environment right here. And it's going to find all the matching groups that we care about, figure out who the users are in the group, and you kind of see that happening down here in the console. It's, it's pulled all those users off the Tableau server. It's comparing those to a query that it's running based on job codes um, that are approved for access. The um, decision is all based on some regular expression patterns, and I'll show you that in a second. Because our job codes follow certain patterns, so there'll be a letter which indicates the ladder. The next two digits represent the level of the employee. So I think eight and above is, uh, or maybe nine and above is, is manager, if I remember, I can't remember exactly at the moment. Um, and then uh, tied to that also are departments and business units. And the business units, all the hospitals begin with H, all the physician practice stuff begin with P. So it's easy for me to identify where these users actually report. And so if we scroll down to the bottom, this should have completed by now, we get a summary that tells us for each group that it managed, you know, what all changes were made. And this is already run once today, so there's not a whole lot of activity that's going on. But we get a new census file every day from PeopleSoft with what job codes people are in, and this script runs every day just through Task Scheduler uh, to update that. So we flip to Exa Plus and show you these tables. Group security. Okay, so this is the data custodian table. Um, it's simple, it just says, okay, here's the data domain, and here are the groups on Tableau server that we're trying to manage. Um, and one of these is a master or a parent of, of some of the other groups. So you've got employee workbook access, and it has three subgroups. And so you can see the, the parent group of these three here for corporate, physician, enterprise, and hospital are all employee workbook access. So I've just got a query set up that um, will never let these sub um, groups have greater access than the parent group. Uh, and these groups are actually managed inside of the Tableau work group, or workbook to say, you should be able to see corporate departments, you should be able to see hospital departments, and you should be able to see physician enterprise departments. But the project level is actually being managed here. So all this script is doing is managing these groups. And if we look at the table that drives the access, you can see you've got a Tableau group name, we've got job patterns, um, the date it was approved, who approved it, a business unit pattern, a GL department pattern, and then we've got an exception um, user ID over here. And I think to the right, we store the justification, the reason for why we actually gave this job code um, access. So let me find one that has multiple kind of rules. So the job pattern, um, business unit, and GL department, all those are kind of like and statements where this is the, um, the case and this is the case. Any kind of or rules would be new records in this table. So this one here for clinical workbook access, you can see there's a regular expression pattern here. So it's the L ladder uh, levels 8 through 15. And then if we scroll over to the right, we've got a list of departments that are being excluded. This is just some pattern matching logic that says it's not one of these things. And so it'll find, it'll query our um, PeopleSoft data, data table, our census information, and figure out who all matches this criteria, report those employees back. Those employee IDs then get written back into the group in Tableau server. And that's what the script does that you just saw. All right, next one, metadata management. So let me kick this one off. Actually, let me, uh, let me make a change here first. So we've got this metadata test here. So I've got this source that I've just connected to in XSL. I've given a name XSL test data source. And you can see when I mouse over these fields, there's no description here, right? So let's publish this out to Tableau Server. Zoom out. Publish to server. I'm going to publish it. Yes. So you can clearly see there's no description in those fields. 
Now, publish out to Tableau server. It didn't have to move any data. It's just a description of the source. And let's flip over to Python. I'm going to execute this. And while this runs, I'm going to talk you through it real quick. So I've got some functions here. Uh, this one will unzip a file. Sometimes the, anything that begins with, ends with an X in Tableau is actually a zip file. So it just unzips the contents of it. Uh, it's got some word wrap features in here. So this is for making sure the comments were uh, wrapped to the next line after a certain width. Uh, and this add space thing is nice because you know how Tableau, when you connect to a data source, will add spaces between camel case words, which is super nice, right? If I add a new field to that table in the back end, Tableau doesn't run that process again, so this fixes that. So that's super nice. It connects to my data dictionary in XSL, downloads all that into a dictionary object in Python. This is the script, part of the script um, that updates the XML. So this just loops through all the different tag elements, the map tags, the column tags, the metadata record tags. In the column tags is where there's a description tag, and that's what actually needs to get updated with the um, description we want to see when we mouse over the field. And then down here at the bottom, we log into Tableau server. There's a function here that logs into each site, downloads the um, sources that begin with XSL and are owned by the system account. And then it runs that function to update the XML, and then here on this line, it republishes the ta Tableau server. So the whole thing's automated. And so down here, we can see what happened. It connected to our data dictionary. It made some snapshot directories, because I don't want to update these files and not have a copy of what I actually uh, modified, in case I actually happen to break something. And then it, uh, it downloaded the patient encounter source, and you can see it also downloaded and updated our test, XSL test data source. So let's click over to Tableau, and let's connect to that source on Tableau server now. I guess I should type in test. All right, this is the one we just created. And if we mouse over some of these fields now, you can see it now has these nice descriptions and it all wrote automatically. Well, there we go. Very cool. All right, just in time, subject marked materializ uh, materialization. Um, I'm going to actually play that one as the video because that's the one I don't want to actually run. Data management, just in time. Oops. All right, so what I want to demo for you now is something that I call um, just-in-time subject area mart materialization. So think of this the same way you would think of a extract running um, and being produced on Tableau server. Even in XSL, um, you're going to want to build your dashboards on the smallest data set um, possible, especially if it's important and people expect it to run really fast. You don't want everything to have to run against a billion records to get the answer. So what you'll do is you'll write you know, a series of views that connect your tables together, run your filters, do various logic, and uh, in the end, we'll just materialize a table that represents that data set, which is much smaller than uh, the sum of all of its parts. The thing that always annoyed me, though, with running extracts on Tableau server, at least with the kind of in-the-box functionality, is that you have to schedule those extracts to run at a particular time of the day. But there was always some level of unpredictability when it came to the data loads uh, in my source system. So hopefully I would pick these up after the data sources have loaded. Worst case scenario, I pick them up during the load and I end up with a data set that's really bad and I've got to rerun the extract and um, it's not ideal at all. So we, to play it safe, I would generally schedule these things to run hours after the data loads have actually happened, which delayed uh, the delivery of those data sets to my Tableau users. But what we have the ability to do now with XSOL is actually monitor all of our data loads and look for when there's been commits to the tables that we're dependent on to build our different subject area marts. And once all those dependencies have been updated, 
then we can actually fire off a job that will materialize um, the view into a table that um, is what Tableau references in the end. So the table that you're looking at here is a list of all the jobs that we have. So whenever we have some new thing that we want to materialize, we just add another record to this table. We list out the source object, which is a view that contains the codes um, that we want to materialize. Where do we want to materialize it to? What's its new name as a table? Uh, and then we've got information about when it was last checked, when it was last run, how long it took to run the last time we ran it in seconds. And then a list of its dependencies. So these are a list of all the objects that have to be updated before the job will actually fire. And then we have a check comment that will tell you, um, you know, what was the last thing that happened. It's run today already, so it's not run again. Or maybe the dependencies haven't been updated, so it reports that back. And then we get a status, and then we also can control uh, things. So if we don't want things to run before a certain hour of the day, then we can specify that as well. So that we can see this in action, this is later in the day, and so everything that has been, um, that could have been updated, has been updated, and so nothing's going to run if I don't um, change the last run date. So I'm going to do that on job number nine here. It doesn't take that long to run job nine, so I am going to set it back to yesterday's date. And so I'm just going to update, see the job ID, set the last run date to yesterday's date execute that. Now this is the, the script that actually runs to do the job. So all the scripts in XSOL are coded in Lua. You can write user-defined functions in other languages, but for things that are run by um, the command execute script, those are all written in Lua. I'm not going to bother trying to explain um, the Lua code to you. Lua itself is not too dissimilar from Python. Um, some different syntax you have to learn and it doesn't uh, depend on your uh, indenting like Python does. But essentially it's going to um, connect to that table I just showed you, loop through each thing, check its dependencies, there's a set of system tables it can check to see when the last commits occurred and then it'll compare the view to the table, see if it needs to just rebuild it entirely or whether if it just needs to truncate and reload the records. It'll reestablish the distribution keys if it has to to make everything fast. Um, but this is the script. And then to um, we'll come over here and we'll actually execute it. And I'm going to execute this with output so we can kind of see the outcome of this. I'm going to switch over to another Exa Plus instance so we can kind of monitor what's going on here. I've got that table mapped to a hotkey, so I can just press Control 2. And it's going to run and pull back um, the table that controls my jobs. So if we look, we can see it's going through. It is um, checking things. It's actually already generated job number 9's table. It took a second to actually generate that data set. And it's going to continue running down the list. I can keep refreshing this and kind of look over to the right. should see that other things are being checked here as it moves further down the list getting towards the bottom now flip back over to the exa, other exa plus client we should see that job complete yep. and it's generated all the output I can see um, this is just like running print in Python where I can see all the, the activities that occurred so it checked job number one it checked each of the dependencies that are listed in here and it gave an update as to whether you know, it ran or not. We scroll down a little bit and let's find job number nine. Here it is. So if check the dependencies, it's been updated, it ran a truncate and insert and updated the table and reported the status back. So just like that, as soon all right, so running out of time. Uh, I think there's five minutes left here. Uh, so I won't demo the, the edit thing or kind of show the demo with the connection to, uh, to XSOL with the 1.8 billion records, but if anybody wants to see that afterwards, I can show it to you. Um, so I'll pause here and see if anybody has any questions. Yes, and I think uh, we wanted to get the mic to them. Yeah, I think for the recording, they wanted the mic so they could actually hear the question.
test one. Yep, it's live. Uh, could you go back to the metadata management uh, examples a little bit and talk about where the data definitions are actually stored? Is that something in Exasol or are you storing data definitions somewhere else? Yeah, so the nice uh, example is when the vendor has actually supplied a data set of data dictionary tables, we'll just source those into Exasol, uh, making that part of it really easy. Then it's just a mapping of this field equals, the, and Exasol equals this field in the source system. Uh, when that doesn't happen, then we write those in manually and actually manage that whole set of data dictionary tables using Excel. So I've got an Excel spreadsheet that downloads all the stuff from Exasol. People can make direct edits in Excel, and then it just writes the SQL statements for you to do the updates. And so that's really how we manage it. Um, eventually, I'd like to see a kind of web form tool for that. Um, maybe something that could even be integrated with the extension stuff that Tableau talked about. So end users could actually update it from desktop. Yes. Great presentation, first of all. Thank you. Um, so you talked about the column level security, but how do you manage row level security? And if you do, and if you had like a billion records and you're looking for a subset of that, like 100, 200 records for a user uh, at the row level, mm -hmm. how do you do and how does it work? It basically works the same way as what I showed you with the column level security stuff. It's just um, I'll put a where exist kind of statement at the very bottom that says, okay, where this user exists. Um, that matches to the session ID and the service area that that user is tied to matches to a record, um, like a service area record in a transactional field, then that's the only data that's gonna come back. And XSL is really efficient at running those where exists kinds of um, functions. Um, I've got an example of where I've used that edit tool that lets me do direct entry, where the users that manage are affiliate providers. When we get new affiliate providers in, they go and edit that web form and say this group in Tableau server is this service area in the database, and so that's all immediate, um, and it would pass through into the view and control what records people see, and that would happen for every source where I've put that where clause in, but I still have to put the initial SQL statement in in order to identify the user with the database session. Yes, Dan. Um, so it's really cool that you can run Python and some scripting languages in here, um, but for traditional like DBA types, with you, it looks like you can almost think about XSL as like a database where it's, it's tables and there's loads to them and then views and you can write live SQL. D would you say that that's a fair assessment of working with XSL or is it a bit more tinkery um, that it's, it's more command line or more scripting to actually get it data in and working with it or like more? Yeah, yeah. I mean you, you get data in just like you would any other database just with an ETL tool. It's way faster if you do it from a CSV file because ODBC and JDBC are just inherently slow. So if you can generate a CSV file of your source system and import that into XSL, that's gonna be a significantly faster process. So you can use any standard ETL tool. We use um, Oracle Data Integrator to do that work. Um, the scripting is not that hard to learn. You don't have to know scripting to do things. Most of the stuff that we do is just um, view logic that we've written that would be standard SQL code uh, that we would write. Yeah. Yes? Hey. Uh, phenomenal presentation, dashboards all the way down to scripting. We are dealing with a lot of the same uh, kind of uh, work, so I truly relate to it, appreciate uh, all the innovation that you put in there. Um, before you selected Exasol, did you look at other vendors? Why did you go with Exasol? Um, mm -hmm. And um, any limitations? I know. This is an yeah. XSO uh, presentation, but yeah. any uh, any things for which XSO is not as yeah. good as compared to? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an XSO sponsored thing, but I'll be honest with you, so. <laughs> the um, We looked at Vertica, we looked at Microsoft Parallel Data Warehouse, and we looked at Oracle. Um, we ruled out Microsoft early on because of a lack of features, so we'd lose things like percentiles and medians uh, as calculations that we could write at the Tableau layer. So that was a non-starter for us. Um, we also heard from them that it wasn't gonna be as fast as the Tableau extract, so that was not good either. Um, Oracle, we kind of let them go on price. Um, and then Vertica I played with, I put it in a virtual environment. It was kind of hard to set up. Exasol was super easy to set up. They just have a OVA virtual file you can load into um, Oracle Box, or yeah, Virtual Box, right, and just set up a VM and it stand up in a few minutes. And the, the only thing that I can't do at the Tableau layer with um, Exasol is use regular expressions. 
And that's not because the database doesn't do it, that's just because Tableau hasn't gotten around to implementing that. Jason, if you could help me. Yeah, 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 if you'll help me out with that. <laughs> but it uses the exact same stuff, because you can use regular expressions with Oracle, and um, XSL uses Oracle syntax, and it has the exact same implementation of regular expressions. Tableau just has to write the code to transform what you put in a calculation window into the SQL code. But everything else is there. And just as a follow-up to that, what kind of hardware sits behind, say, a trillion dollar, or a trillion row? Yes, yeah, definitely not a trillion dollars. <laughs> trillion row. I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm familiar with Piedmont, and you have really high ratings in yeah. the STAR program, everything I can see, how you achieve that as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a hardware guy. I know that there are um, Dell servers that we've brought in to spec according to them. I think um, we spent maybe 60 grand or something like that on hardware um, that we installed XSL on. And it's um, 300 gigs uh, of RAM. The processor is one of you know, the high RAM processors. But, yeah. No, no SSD drives. They're running off spinning drives. If you're um, spending 60K in hardware, what would be the XSL license to run? What would be the cost of the XSL license on top of that? I'm going to let XSL answer that question for you. <laughs> I think they've actually got new pricing models and everything, so I, I don't actually know um, all the options that you have. Can you talk a little bit about what your team does in terms of using XSL and Tableau versus what IT supports? Like, where's the line draw between you managing the mm -hmm. cluster and being able to configure it versus relying on someone else to? Um, it's a blurred line. We have a really good relationship with um, RS Group now. Um, uh, it's definitely improved dramatically since from when we began the program. Um, but we largely manage the XSL cluster because we're a Windows shop and they were a little worried about managing a Linux server and everything, but it's kind of an appliance, so the, the application and the OS are all together. When you boot up the OS, it boots right into the application. So it's not that complicated. Um, I'm still a little intimidated by it, which is why I though, um, use their 24-7 support, so in case something does go wrong, I can easily get them on the phone and to help me out with it. <clears throat> but then my team's responsible for really the visualization layer, mostly, and the modeling piece of it um, to get the data in the form we need. The, uh, the data architect group at the moment is spending most of their time doing a lot of the ETL work and monitoring uh, piece of it all. And so you mentioned you've got a lot of stuff historically in SQL Server and you're moving some of that to XSL. I think you mentioned Oracle Data Integrator. Is that your main tool to move? Yeah, for, stuff for years we used SSIS because we were a Microsoft shop, um, but we just had lots of problems with versioning of Visual Studio. And so the, my counterpart, the director of data architecture, is like, I'm sick of it and I'm finding something new, and so we use Oracle Data Integrator. Right. Uh, one thing to note about XSL is that you don't um, need somebody behind the scenes to tune it. Like, I don't need anybody monitoring to create indexes. XSL will run a query unless it creates an index. The first thing it does is create an index. The next person that hits that table gets much better performance because it doesn't have to recreate the index. No. Anyone? Yeah, feel free to come um, chat with me afterwards. Be sure to fill out the survey if you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, give me fives because then that will let, get them to want to have me back. So, Let's be sure. you talked about um, like incremental loads. Can you talk about how that works, either in your ETL or in XSL? Like what? Uh, that's yeah. my biggest complaint with like Tableau data sources. There's various ways. I mean, for some tables, it can be as simple as look and see what the last date is in our table here, and then compare that to what's on our source system and grab every record that's after that date, and we load those in. Um, the reason it's not a problem like Extracts is is because we can extract the individual tables that have been updated versus kind of joining all these things into a big flat table, and whereas some things down here have been updated. When you're managing by table, that's much easier. Uh, for some, some of the more complex things, there are actual tables in our um, healthcare record system which indicate whether things have been added or deleted or removed. So we'll have to read from that table in order to figure out what records should we go grab in the source system. So are you able to do like update statements to tables? Or do you yep, know? updates and merges and Great. all that kind of stuff. Yep, exactly. So we will stage the data that comes from a CSV file and then run a merge statement into the primary table. So you put out a CSV of the changes, are you able to um, like bulk update or do you have to 
Yeah, well, so the data bulk loads from the CSV file into a staging table, and that has maybe the 100,000 records that need to be merged in. And some okay. of them might be updates, so if it's, if it's going to update thing versus just kind of append, yeah. then you'll use merge so gotcha. that you can kind of say, when you find a match, then just update the record versus um, inserting. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? Anyone? Great. Woo. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks for coming.